Good afternoon and welcome to our New York Archives Magazine online speaker series. Today we're joined by a great group of people to talk about my favorite thing, New York Archives Magazine. We're celebrating 20 years of publication, so happy birthday to us. And we'll be talking about the magazine's vision, evolution, and future, and our mission of making the history of our state accessible to a broad audience. So let me start by telling you a little bit about who is joining us for the conversation today. Judy Homan is the founding editor of New York Archives Magazine and continued in that capacity until her retirement in 2012. She also managed the public programs of the New York State Archives, ranging from exhibits and events to publications and teacher training. She's been recognized by the Mid-Atlantic Regional Archives Conference and the Society of American Archivists for her efforts to increase public awareness of archives and their importance to the foundations of our democracy. Former New York State Assistant Education Commissioner and New York State Archivist, V. Chapman Smith, is now retired after over 30 years of executive leadership and organizational capacity building. After her time in New York State, she served as National Archives Mid-Atlantic Regional Administrator and spearheaded a number of public history initiatives. As chair of the Philadelphia Federal Executive Board, her work included the erection of the first public monument in Philadelphia to honor an African-American 19th century civil rights leader, O.V. Cato, along with a year-long education initiative for the Philadelphia School District to study his legacy. In her retirement, she volunteers as a civil rights and social public historian. She serves as a project manager to preserve the historical assets of Eden Cemetery, a national historic site, and the oldest continuously operating African-American cemetery company in the US, and on the board of Eastern State Penitentiary Historical Site, a site dedicated to interpreting the legacy of American criminal justice reform. Chris Fitzgerald is principal of 2K Design, the visual communication studio she founded in 1995. In addition to designing New York Archives Magazine for the past 20 years, her work includes brand identity, print collateral, web packaging, signage, and exhibit design for clients such as the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor, Union College, Avon Old Farm School, and other governmental agencies, educational institutions, and nonprofits. Lawrence M. Hauptman is a SUNY Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History. In 2011, he was given the State Archives Lifetime Achievement Award for his Empire State Research and Writing. Houtman, the author of books on Native Americans, has been honored by the Seneca Nation, the New York State Board of Regents, the Pennsylvania Historical Association, the Wisconsin Historical Society, the New York Academy of History, the New York State Historical Association, and Mohonk Consultations. Paul Grondahl is the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany and a former longtime reporter at the Albany Times Union, where he still writes a weekly column. He's the author of several books, including political biographies of Albany Mayor Erastus Corning II and Theodore Roosevelt's early political career in Albany. So that's who's joining us today. For a little housekeeping, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So if you're out there listening to us, feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box during the course of this conversation, and we'll try to get to them at the end. So without further ado, let's talk about 20 years of New York archives. And let's start with Judy Homan, founding editor of this magazine and my personal hero. Please tell us how this magazine came to be. Well, in the uh, interest of full disclosure, uh, I had to consult with V and to see if her memory was the same as mine as to how it got started. And no, our memories weren't the same. <laughs> what I do remember is that we wanted to the trust was going to be a membership organization. So if you're a membership organization, you have to give the members something. And there we are, what can we give them? We can't give them archival records. Uh, we bemoan the fact that we weren't a museum because we could give them a discount at the museum shop. So what we were going to do, and I think we batted around a lot of ideas and the magazine came up. I have always loved magazines. When I think about it, I've always, at least in the days when everything was paper, always subscribed to many, whether it was a Newsweek, the Smithsonian, Red Book, when, when it used to publish uh, short stories. Uh, so magazines have always been a part of my life. So we decided, oh, we'll, we'll do a magazine. 
And I do remember um, talking with uh, Jim Foltz, who was saying, you know, how are we going to do this? And I remember being <laughs> Uh, very cynical and saying, ah, it's never going to happen. You know, we talk about it now, but resources will be pulled or something's going to happen. And, but no, we had V as our leader and V was going to make sure it happened because she was giving us all the support that we needed. And so um, we, we gathered people together. We, we got uh, consultants, a lot of staff people involved. I mean, believe me, this, I was not flying solo on this. I had a lot of support. Um, and we managed to pull the first issue together in less than six months. Um, and we celebrated, uh, one of my colleagues reminded me that, that we celebrated with chocolate cigars, like a baby was born. And, and that was just wonderful. And it wasn't until the next day that my heart sunk because I realized I had another issue to put out and I hadn't even thought about the other issue. So that, that's kind of a little capsule of uh, how, it, how it all started. And I don't know, V, if, if, I'm sure you have other memories. <laughs> well, you know, I sort of look at the whole work that I did at the New York Arch State Archives in a somewhat different lens, because I saw myself coming into that organization to be an enabler of good ideas. And your idea about doing a magazine, to me, was not only good, it was a great idea. And we needed something, not just uh, for membership, but we needed something to make people see us and to also make us relevant to the various communities around New York State. So, you know, one of the great features of this magazine, it not only talks about the collections of the New York State archives, but it talks about New York archives. And we, we did batter, bat around what the title of the magazine would be. We would have easily called it New York State archives. But, you know, the thing that I was really pushing to see happen is that we don't pigeonhole this magazine as just something about the New York uh, State Archives, because we had a lot of advocacy work to do. When I was archivist, we had to make sure that the funding for the State Archives and its programs, which had a broad swath of things that it took care of for New York State, that they had to be renewed for funding. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that that magazine was also key to helping us make sure that funding was renewed. And Judy may remember that uh, during the time that I was uh, archivist, we were able to get that funding renewed unanimously by the New York State Legislature, who don't agree on anything, <laughs> but they did wrap their arms around the stories and the work that we were doing, and we just needed to give people a vehicle to talk about it. So that magazine went to every state legislator. Le legislator. It went to the schools. It went to all of the different organizations we uh, funded with our grant program. And they could hold it up and say, here's why we, this place is important. We didn't, we didn't have to go around talking about ourselves. We had other people talking about ourselves, us, and this magazine was very key. And I loved it because the graphics were so strong, the pictures were compelling. And as I had uh, told um, Josie, my favorite one was the first one because it actually catch, caught your breath. It made you realize that this was going to be something really engaging. I love that photograph. It was like, the besides the fact that I loved eating oysters. <laughs> uh, I collect photography and I love art in my life. Uh, it's just a, who, a part of who I am. I'm not just a historian. But when I saw that picture, it took my breath away. And I remember you bringing it in and asking me, should we use that one? And I'm like, Yes, we need to use that one because it's going to draw people's eyes into that picture. 
and they'll say, well, archives isn't the old dusty documents that I think they are. They're something else. And so, Judy, you were the brain of the magazine because you had to keep coming up with ideas that would be very compelling. And Chris was the magician <laughs> who took what we put together and did her, I don't want to call it design voodoo, but she made things just pop. And the magazine became something that was easy to read, approachable to people, and it really helped us with our advocacy. It was Chris's idea, I remember when we were talking about this, that we would never, and I believe the word is jump the article. You would start it on page four or five or whatever, and you would be able to turn the pages. You wouldn't have to flip to the back and, and find the remains of the article. So uh, I, I remember, Chris, you were adamant about that. I don't remember that, but that, that's a good <laughs> thought. <laughs> Yeah, it's been 20 years, that's, that's, that's for sure. Um, yeah. I do remember when thinking about the stories, uh, my, my goal was that with, for every story, people would say, gee, I didn't know that, and make connections where you, you would never think there was a connection. Um, one thing that I thought of, my husband is a big football guy. So football is, is part of our house. And I was able to tell him based on archival research and an article in the, the magazine that the forward pass was used uh, in, they didn't invent it, but the, the big football game between Notre Dame and Army, Notre Dame used the forward pass and they clobbered Army. And from that day on, the forward pass became an integral part of the game. And I knew that my husband didn't, and probably most football fans didn't know it, based on our couple research. Who knew? <laughs> what a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing. I get off on things like that. that that's, <laughs> that's But I think that's one of the things that makes the magazine so great is, is the variety and, and you know, breadth of the kinds of topics that it's covered over 20 years. And Honestly, what Chris, was it 485 feature stories we've oh, had? Over I, the it might have been 512. Was that a I, large like number? That. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, and they're and when you think about that, they're all New York State stories. It's just, it's really incredible. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of variety. But I do want to talk a little bit about the design because I, you know, I, I have only been editor of this magazine since 2013, but I've been an avid reader of it for uh, almost its whole history. And one of the things that, you know, that I've always been impressed by is the design. And it, and it started out right with that first issue. It was obviously well-planned and, and the design has always really helped to, to tell the stories. And it's, and it's a big piece of why I think the magazine has been successful. So Chris, would you, would you tell us how you and Judy approached that initial, the design on that first issue? and and how that's evolved over time for you? Sure, so 20 years and 80 issues, it's kind of hard to remember exactly that first one. Um, <laughs> but I do remember, like V said earlier, thinking that it was really gonna be special. Um, and it really was a special publication. The more I worked on it, the more I just felt that. Um, and really it was Judy's vision. Um, she just knew exactly what she wanted. She had a vision for what it was gonna be. And she really wanted to create something that it was gonna bring New York history to life in a way that hadn't been done before. So um, my approach to doing that was really to, I, what I would do in the, the process that we kind of worked through was Judy would kind of hand me this pile and it would be this big, almost like a, it was almost like an event, every issue. She'd come with her little folder and she'd drop it down on the table and, and we'd go through some of the stuff and. I'd run all the content in and then I would read the entire thing cover to cover so that I knew really what the stories were about and what I needed to, what images I needed to, to find to tell the story if we didn't already have them. Judy did a lot of research and so that was great. Um, but my, my approach to designing has always been to try and communicate the essence of the story through type and image. And 
So that first issue, um, I'm going to share my screen here because I, I have a few show and tell, um, a few spreads to share. Um, so the first issue um, included the story the day the Montauk Indians became extinct. And so um, this is, um, it has a photograph, but the treatment of the photograph, just the way it kind of fades out on the, on the bottom, gives you that kind of idea of, you know, the Indians becoming extinct. Um, so there's little things like that treatments and things that I try and, and do, but um, one of the th imagery is such a huge part of storytelling and because of the record taker, the care record tear caretakers over the centuries and today's archivists um, and repositories, our research efforts usually uncover some great images, but that's not always the case. Um, and so sometimes depending on the period of the story um, or um, the topic, whatever, their visuals are really more of a challenge. And so one of the things that um, has become a big part of the design is the treatment of headlines for the feature stories. Um, so I kind of have a few slides here that um, are some of my favorites, Woodstock. And it's, you know, the typeface itself and the tie dye is totally fits the story. Um, and that's really, really key and really important uh, when I'm developing these um, piece, the, the feature stories. Um, Gaslight era, era, this is one of my all time favorites. I loved the image and as soon as I saw it, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the type that really ornate Victorian with the glow around the outside and the inner shadow and all of the, the decorative edges that Victorian look really kind of harkened that era. Um, another one from that same issue, these were both from fall 2012. Um, this one was great. Um, I loved the photograph um, of uh, Carlisle Floyd and just the way he had the cigarette in his hand. Um, lots of times I use flourishes to, to, for stories that kind of uh, involve music because I like the fluidity of the strokes. But for this one, it was also great because it kind of, as his cigarette was hanging out up there, it was also like, you know, little swirls of smoke as well. Um, so those are just things as I'm looking through the visuals and I'm, I'm thinking about design, these are some of the things that kind of come to mind. Um, the business of politics, this was another one, um, you know, voting your little button um, to, for the headline treatment. And then the bunting at the top, obviously you get politics right off the bat. Uh, the woman behind the glass, this is another one. Um, this is about Claire Walcott Driscoll. And actually there's, she's been in the new, or she was kind of, I think brought to light more recently. There was a um, biography done about her, but she was uh, a um, glass artist for Tiffany um, who, and she designed a, a lot of his artwork. And so for this one, I took the period type, the Art Nouveau, which is very indicative of Tiffany lamps and used a transparent treatment. So while the words are in front of the, the um, photograph, they're also a little bit behind it to kind of get the idea of the woman behind the glass and the type is transparent to get that frosted glass kind of look. Um, trains to home. This one, I love the type treatment. Um, I felt like the, the the type period was great. Um, the swirls again are, are smoke. Um, unfortunately for this, I couldn't have, I couldn't flop the image and I couldn't have the headline treatment over the smokestacks, but you still kind of get the idea um, in that essence. So um, sometimes you have to make little sacrifices here and there. Um, this, this one divided by war, um, lots of times visuals that we get are, um, portraits. There's, there's a ton of portraits. Uh, and just plunking a portrait in a box on a page really doesn't really speak much to me. Um, so this one, I, I tried to kind of illustrate the divide um, with that torn paper edges and the, the rough type. Um, so it was a little bit different way to treat um, portraits. Uh, the next one, the Enlightened Censor, obviously a movie headline from the black and white era. 
the hatching and catching fish, this is um, again, one of my favorites. There's a lot of details um, for this one. Uh, this one was inspired by the fish that you see swimming on the page. Josie gave me these great images of fish. These illustrations were fantastic. But again, just plunking a box on a page, you know, it doesn't really do much to tell the story. So um, I found a piece of a uh, stock photo of uh, deckled edge paper and used that as the background. And then the treatment, the typography, the bubbles in the strokes of the type and the S's are hooks. And then there's just some little flourishes that are splashing elements, but it really just kind of gets that, you get the, the pole fishing idea. Um, the next one is daily bread. Again, another one of my favorites. Um, the strokes on this one contained uh, wheat and then really, it, it, but it was a little bit subtle. So to really kind of bring it home, I used the, the wheat that wrapped in and wove through the type itself. Um, and one of my favorite things about this story um, was there was a recipe with it. And so I found a uh, recipe for shortbread. So I found a stock image of shortbread and then a stock image of a vintage uh, recipe card and just uh, put, put the type on top of it and made it a little sidebar. So, um, and then I think this is the last one I have, um, the Dolly Diplomacy. It was a story about a theater exchange program, program with Russia. And so very constructivist, uh, typography type treatment for the headline. Um, and I love the Raggedy Ann illustration to the photograph. So, so that's, um, those are my little, um, all of my little visuals that I have to share and I will stop sharing. Um, so all of these spreads really show the diversity in the topics, the time periods and the design styles that we've covered. And that's one of the things I love. It's not just, you know, civil horror history or military history or, or documents. It's really a huge range from sports and um, military history to anything you can think of. And I know that was one of the things jo Judy was really adamant that this had to be something for everybody. It had to to really, as the archives use their tagline, keep history alive. Um, and so we just covered a, a wide range. Um, so as the design continues to evolve, um, we always try different things in the layouts. One of the things Judy came up with early on was the archives connection, um, because again, that really uh, explained to people how research is done, where, these, the, where the information is found. Um, so it, it highlights the importance of the historical records. Um, I started using pull quotes to highlight some of the main points of the story. So those kind of became another element. Um, and Josie's created a couple new departments with marking history and caption this, um, hoping that we could kind of engage our readers a little bit more to kind of communicate with us, you know, by sending in a caption or by going out and actually visiting some of these historical sites where the markers are. Um, and now since this is an educational tool, we've also added a sidebar um, reference to previous stories since there are so many. Um, and it makes it easy for uh, educators to find uh, issues with similar topics if they are choosing to, um, to use these stories in the classroom. Um, so last year, as uh, we began the celebration of the 20th anniversary, Josie and Donna, our assistant editor, and I brought the magazine to social media, which has been another way that we really tried to engage with our readers and our audience. Um, it's been a great way to really go back and showcase a lot of our favorite stories um, and promote the upcoming issues, promote things, events like this, the speaker series. Um, and we're, our hope is that the social media will eventually grow our readership um, so that the magazine will be sustainable for forever, um, even after I'm gone. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be another 20 years. Um, but, um, but this magazine has truly been one of the highlights of my design career, especially because I've been so fortunate to work with uh, Judy and Josie who have been completely dedicated and have poured their heart and soul into uh, this magazine. So, and um, as Judy pointed out earlier, yes, my love of history has grown with each issue. Um, 
because these stories really, they show us how relevant our past is to our present and our future and how much we can learn from it if we really choose to. So that's, that's the design of New York Archives. So I, I would like to mention that, you know, we're speaking about this magazine as being relevant to New York and seen by New Yorkers. But I will tell you, uh, during my tenure in Philadelphia as regional administrator for the National Archives, I had a number of people who knew I had been in New York. They didn't necessarily know what I did because I never told them, but <laughs> they would come to my office and say, do you know anything about this magazine? <laughs> it was pretty funny to hear them ask me that question. But one of the groups that was most interested, and Judy, you may remember this, was the Mid-Atlantic Regional Humanities Council that was uh, led by Howard Gillette. And he loved that magazine. And so he brought a group of people together and had Judy come down to Philadelphia to talk about the New York State magazine because he was trying to build awareness around mid-Atlantic humanities and he was trying to find a way to reach a general audience. And that magazine spoke to him. So I don't know if Judy has anything else to say about that, but to me, you know, we need to recognize that this magazine has and probably continues to have a wider interest uh, of people beyond New York State. Uh, the stories are compelling and they're relatable to other parts of the country, but the concept of the magazine and the design of the magazine also is unique. You don't, I would say, uh, if anybody can find another magazine that's like this magazine, I ask them to send it to Josie so she can send it to me because I've never seen it. But I have had people come to me and say, do you know anything about this magazine? <laughs> And they've admired it. So I just wanted to add that comment about it. Well, thank you. I, I vaguely remember that meeting with, with Howard Gillette. It, that, you jogged my, my mind about it. Um, one thing I do want to say, because I'm uh, afraid that, that uh, I'll, I'll lose track of this. Uh, one of the reasons the magazine became so successful is Jean Finley, who is my assistant, she brought the quality to those articles because she knew grammar and punctuation up one side and down the other. And more importantly, when we would revise an article, it was her creativity that really came into play. Now I'm the one who had to go back to the author and say, oops, we made some changes. But usually because she was so subtle and creative, the author did accept the changes. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, and you know, I have to say, I, I realize the magazine is important, uh, but I have to tell you, certainly at the beginning, it was such a scramble. It was such a challenge that I don't think I lifted my head up enough to hear all that was happening. I was just scrambling for deadlines. And I just have one visual with Chris and me. I would stand on Madison Avenue with this huge pile this is pre-digital folks. So there were floppies, there were hardcovers, that everything. And here she would come down Madison Avenue and I think your Range Rover and just pull <laughs> off to the side, I hand it off and it was gone. And that's one of the, the visuals I have as far as the production goes. I can't imagine doing this in the days before <laughs> digital. Really. It's amazing. Um, and I do want to say I, I had the pleasure of working with Jean for a few years there too, and she was fantastic. And Donna is also excellent. Such a, uh, an important part of this is that, you know, assistant editor who's really doing the lion's share of the work to, to whip these articles into shape. But I have a question for you, Judy. How did you, I noticed in that first um, issue, you wrote, you, you yourself wrote a few of those articles. How did you find authors in those early issues? Uh, and some of the earliest ones you found were Larry and Paul. Yes. How did you rope them in? Um, 
They, because, you know, honestly, at the very beginning, um, the, the people who wrote for the magazine bought into the concept, the idea that we're going to explain to people why archives are important. We're going to do it in a way by linking it to interesting articles that they've never heard of. And we're going to say archives are responsible for us getting this information out. So it was their dedication. People like Larry, who I'm sure just put everything aside and then would get those irritating phone calls from me. Did you do it? Did you do it yet? Did you send it? You know, kind of thing. Uh, and, and then a lot of the ideas would come from staff. We had a lot of staff buy-in, uh, including when Chris would design covers, we would put several of the covers out in, in the office and basically alert people, hey, come on down and, and get your vote. Uh, so the staff would say, oh, you know, I think so-and-so is writing about or knows about or ask him. And again, especially if it was someone, a, a historian or someone like Larry who knew what we were doing, I, lived, I really think they did drop everything and, and, and meet the deadline. Larry, am I wrong? Well, you were my coach. <laughs> <laughs> coach, that's a nice word. <laughs> yeah, co coach Judy. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I didn't sleep very much those days. <laughs> yeah, no, I see. Uh, I saw the value right away of the magazine, um, partly because I was working with a, um, an Oneida who uh, encouraged me to do that type of work, you know, to work with the public. In, in his case, his nation, his Native American nation. And um, in other words, to speak to the, you know, the average member of the public out there. But also, you know, I, there was a selfish reason too. I mean, and I guess Paul would understand by, by, writing, by writing for a magazine such as yours, you improve your own writing ability to convey to more so-called academic journals, you know? Um, you, know, you become less verbose, you become less, um, you know, narrow, and, uh, and you, your writing becomes clearer. So there's a, there's a selfish reason too, you know, namely that, that I benefited a great deal by writing for the general public. Um, but also the reactions to the articles brought new information to me from the public, because the public is, has some knowledge as well. So when I write for magazines such as uh, Civil War magazines or the Smithsonian, you know, uh, their American Indian magazine or whatever, I get, I, or for New York Archives, I get reaction. I learn people write to me about the articles and I incorporate that, incorporate that in my, my knowledge, my, gen, my general knowledge. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, and Paul could tell you, I mean, the academic world doesn't reward um, writing for gen the general public, you know, the academic world, you know, and that's, right. that's a shame. That's really a shame because um, there was a responsibility to share, an academic to share information. There's a really an obligation. And by becoming so narrow, you're really destroying the profession because you're not creating the next generation. You know, you're not creating an interest for the future. So, um, you know, I, I, I know Paul's writings. You know, I remember reading one of uh, Joe Persico, right? What did you do one right. of Joe Persico? That was a wonderful article, you know? And, um, you know, I admire Joe Persico. I, I really did because he had that ability to, to convey good history to the public, you know? Right. And uh, so that's why I write. And uh, when Judy nudges me, you know, and forces me to do this, I'm willing to do it because first of all, I like writing and it relaxes me as I said, but also I benefit myself from it. But, uh, but because of that Native American, that Oneida that I worked for for 43 years before he died of COVID, oh. he, he, he sort of drew me to basically writing for a larger public than five academics at SUNY Albany, whatever, you know? <laughs> well, and the magazine has benefited from your writing over its entire 20 year history. You've, you've contributed 
Yeah. Every every year, I think at least since an article. But you know, one of the things. See, I benefited also because I wrote about one of my two of my relatives, you know, in uh, dealing with the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard. I worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which, of course, that was one of my favorite writing projects because it brought back memories of my aunt and my mother-in-law. You know, so yeah, and it just. But Persico. He, he taught a lesson, you know, he taught a lesson about writing. So I, I admired him. I, I would uh, second what, what Larry said. Um, and I've been involved really because you've been so fortunate in having two fantastic editors, wonderful women to work with, Judy and Josie. It's why I'm still involved and was involved from the beginning because they're not just smart and efficient, they're just kind and friendly and nice to work with. I, I came in not from the academic side, but from the journalism side, and I was writing every day and freelanced a lot and had many different editors, but I can say it was always a pleasure to work with Judy and with Josie because they're real professionals, but like I said, they're also really nice to work with. And it, Albany is, is such a close community. I mean, Jean Finley, I knew since the early 80s, she was at the beginning of the, the Writers Institute, where I am now. Donna LaCorey, I worked with her and her husband at the Times Union, I know them. And, um, you know, so uh, I, I've always appreciated Archives Magazine too, as well, because it's elegant. I mean, I appreciate Chris kind of explaining some of her design uh, concepts and things, but it, it is a cut above any magazine that I subscribe to or that I see or that I get because it, it, it is archival in itself. Like I want to keep that magazine around. One is beautiful. It's high quality stock. It's, it's uh, well edited, really interesting articles. And I like how it's, it's opened up the range of, of people beyond academics. I see a lot of, you know, public historians, a lot of um, uh, people from, from all different professions. And I also like uh, adding, you know, how the kind of behind the scenes practicality of what archives did you use? How did you find these documents? So I've really enjoyed the association. It's amazing, 20 years. And now I'm happy that we, we partner regularly with the Archives Partnership Trust on events with the Writers Institute. So it's been a really nice 20 year run. And I've worked for a lot of magazines that are no longer around either. And I know how hard it is to sustain a magazine and I know the cost. I know it doesn't get any cheaper to produce that magazine. I really appreciate all the people, particularly the board and the people who contribute and the subscribers to sustaining it. Yeah, and now of course, you know, we've talked a little bit about how the magazine was developed as a benefit of membership. We've shifted to a subscription model now. So we really do rely on, on donor support and it's an educational piece. We've, um, you know, we've sort of um, focused a lot on the educational um, uses of the magazine. So, um, you know, there has been an evolution of how, of how the magazine is supported over time. So we are relying on those subscriptions. I also want to point out that Paul, you are a member of our editorial board, which you didn't mention because you're too humble. No, it's, but... it's a great group. I've missed a couple of meetings. This job is, has me very busy, but um, I, I mean, some really brilliant people. I always, I always realize I'm very average. I work hard, but I'm, I go to those meetings and I'm around a lot of brilliant people, you know, and, and I learn stuff from those meetings too, the editorial consultant meetings. So I hope we can do them in person again. That was always fun because you always gave us lunch too, which was really nice. <laughs> we know how to keep you happy. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I don't know if, if maybe people even realize that there is an editorial board that meets. And I think, Judy, you established that early on, right? A, a board of people to review submissions. Um, and so that it's not just, you know, me or it wasn't just you making decisions about what goes in there. We have public historians and archivists and, and journalists and, and lots and scholars who are, are reviewing these submissions and making sure that what goes in our pages is is good scholarship um, and, you know, aside from being readable and accessible to a general audience. Those were some of the best meetings. I mean, it, they really brought out um, everybody's opinion. It was the freewheeling meetings, uh, challenging. Uh, it was, and, and I think that's why the magazine evolved the way it did. 
you had a lot of buy-in, a lot of support, a lot of opinions. I, I think of some particular instances where, where people would be pounding the table saying, you can't print that. It's no, of course you've got to print that. And uh, it was great. It really was. It was a really lively, supportive bunch. I enjoyed that. Well, maybe we should be pounding the table more often. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm always amazed at the encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of our board members and how you know, just even the smallest facts, some of them will know, oh no, it wasn't, you know, 1892, it was 1893. It's amazing. I remember when, when my, one of my colleagues uh, left the archives and, and I, wherever she went, anyway, she said, you, you don't realize how brilliant the people you're working with until you leave. And I often kept that in mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a stellar bunch, it really is. So Paul, I'm curious, um, so you, you touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, obviously this is a tough time for print media and we have always felt strongly about, we have a digital version and it's beautiful. It looks exactly like the print version, but that print version people, I mean, I personally am attached to it, but so are a lot of our readers. And um, you know, your you son. <laughs> and my son, I caught my eight-year-old son intently reading the current issue. Here it is. I left this on my kitchen table. My son was eating his breakfast cereal and I, and I, and I came in to find him intently reading it, like reading the articles, turning the pages, his attention fully absorbed. So we're doing something right with this. With, with the have print. a new audience. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, but what do you think is, you know, why do you think it's important for their, for magazines like New York Archives to, to continue with a print version in this? Because um, I've written for almost 40 years for the University of Albany Alumni Magazine. I'm an alumnus and now I'm staff. I was a longtime adjunct faculty member there. But they just ceased the print publication for financial reasons. So the next issue, which I just wrote for, will be all digital. And that was a difficult decision. I didn't agree with it. Um, again, I think you have to know your audience. I think a certain age, we're all chasing young audiences, but I still write for the Times Union. And I've seen you know, the, the erosion and challenge for newspapers and, and, and all quote unquote legacy media, but you can't forget about your core audience. and. I still am a print person. I'm one of the last in, in my household, but I'm still a print person. And, and I think it has a lot of value um, as a, a, a membership subscriber inducement as well. And there's been many studies, people read print much more in much more engaged way and take in a lot more and spend more time with it than just kind of scrolling on the phone or on their tablet, however they, they uh, consume digital content. So. I, I hope the print publication stays around. I know it can't be easy because I, I know that it's a costly venture, but it's an elegant, something to be very proud of. And like Dee was saying, I'm, I'm a native of <clears throat> Washington state. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a carpetbagger here now, but I've been here 40 years, but uh, I've never seen this in, in the other states where I've lived or where I, where I go. And I think it's a, a mark of pride and something that should continue. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment about whether it should be all digital or can stay as a hybrid magazine. And I think we make a lot of assumptions about younger people and whether they only like digital. I have a, a son who's now turned 34 this past week, and he does a lot of uh, work around uh, digital content, but the boy tells me that he and his colleagues at his filmmaking company love books and magazines. You can have a personal relationship with a book or a magazine. You get to touch it. You get to write in it. You get to engage it in a way that you can't do with digital. And I do think you have to think about your education audience, like your son, who's eight years old. He would not have engaged with that magazine in the same way if it was on his computer. He was sucked into that magazine 
because he could feel the paper. He could see the pictures differently. He might even slop some of his cereal on the magazine, but that's okay to wipe it off. But I tell you, the more, more young people that I meet, and I actually, one of the things that I did do uh, when I came to uh, back to Philadelphia is that we established, I worked with a consortium of people and led them to bring back National History Day that had been away for 25 years. And over the course of the 13 years that I led that program, we engaged more young people with books, magazines, history magazines, you know, kinds of content. Yes, they used some digital tools for researching, but they loved the books. They loved being able to engage with authors even in programming. And so I think we lose something and we have to recognize that there are people who are coming back to books. I mean, they're seeing, they're, we're seeing um, uh, more of a resurgent with the sale of books and magazines now than we've ever seen before. So what's old is new again. But people, you know, I don't know about you, but I get really tired of looking at a screen and I find myself printing out as much as I can because I can't look at the screen that long and my eye vision is going bad. But my little grandson, who just is the age of yours, uh, son says to me, you got any books for me, grandma? <laughs> you got any magazines? You got any history books for me, grandma? <laughs> so I'm just letting you know, don't give it up until you have a chance to assess who you're trying to reach and talk to those teachers. Find out from them how the kids are engaging with it. And even if she only has a couple of copies of the print magazine in her classroom and is using digital in other ways, that print version can be very compelling for a student. So I just put that out there. Don't, don't think that you should all, I, I, if you go to all digital, I will be heartbroken. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have that. <laughs> no. no, please. <laughs> there, is, there is just that, that the, the ability to touch and feel, and especially the, our magazine is so beautifully printed. I mean, just you do touch that magazine and it just has such a, a nice feel to it. Um, but it's also the fact that, you know, and, and when you get something in your inbox, so I get the digital link to the magazine in my inbox. And by the end of the day, it's gone. It's down way, you down know, 20 down. emails down, it's lost. But that print copy just sits there and it waits for me to come get it, you know, and it's there beckoning all the time. Just pick me up, pick me up. <laughs> so I think there's there, it, it still is a relevant media. And I think it's so important that we don't, you know, we don't lose um, publications like this. Yeah, I find myself using both the print and the, and the digital. And they're, they're good for different, different times and different circumstances. But I do, I, I actually have this like thing where I love the smell of the magazine. They come right from <laughs> so, your new car. <laughs> yeah, so that's something I do is breathe deeply. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, we're sort of winding down on time, but I wanted, I know Larry, you mentioned some favorite articles you had and maybe yeah. some of you, uh, others of you would like to chime in on just you know favorite articles, favorite covers. Yeah, well, I like the uh, the one on brewing in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by Ann Myerson right in two thousand five, and uh, how New York got Sunday baseball. I like that one. Uh, two thousand fourteen. Um, I can't remember the author's name, but the uh, I mentioned to you the the article on E. B. O'Callaghan which was excellent. It was an excellent article about this Irish rebel who did so much for New York history in terms of uh, preserving so much of, of New York history. Yeah, like that was that the, the I really radical. I like that one, but I can't think of the, the author's name right now. It's Steve McElaine. It was called The Radical Archivist. Yeah, oh, I yeah. love that. And that, that, that was my favorite, actually. Okay, <laughs> so those three really, I, I really uh, like them. That's great. Well, in the new publication that just came out, I really enjoyed uh, Lillian Williams' article about Barrett. Um, I don't think um, there's a lot that's known 
about the work of African American women, early African American women, late 19th century, early 20th century, in terms of their efforts for the franchise uh, and civil rights. Um, one of the projects I worked on this year for Pennsylvania was looking at uh, a woman who was one of her uh, colleagues in that work, Frances Harper. And what I found is that many of these women have been invisible uh, until recently. I think this last two years, there have been more articles and books uh, put out about these women. But if you actually try to see anything earlier than that, there was nothing there. It was like, that's an unknown story. And um, the role that uh, Barrett played in Bu uh, Buffalo was really important to New York State. And I hadn't really known her story. Uh, I knew Frances's story. I knew the group that she worked with, the National Council for Negro Women, but I didn't know her story. So I appreciate the fact that you're able to pull out these stories that are little known, that can help people see a fuller picture of uh, different issues and things that have happened in our country. So I just wanted to let you know, I thought that was a great article. Yes, yeah, she was amazing. That's, that's more than beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my favorite was my first um, cover, my first issue as editor. So that one's always gonna be close to my heart. <laughs> that was the fall 2013. And then I also love this. That is definitely one of my favorites. It's such a good, what a it's great a image. Anthony. Yep. It's just so striking. And that one was just from the Library of Congress, um, but it's just a really striking image. And that's one of the ones that won uh, that issue, won yep. Graphic Design Award that year. Yep. So that's something we should toot our horns about is that um, most years, this magazine wins a national graphic design award. So actually when I say toot our horns, I mean Chris's horns. <laughs> it's amazing. So those are two of my favorites. Um, if nobody else has ones they want to share, I, we do have a couple of questions from our audience that we can, that we can get to. Um, one of them is, is there a deliberate effort to spread the stories around the state? So I assume that means like within an issue and the answer is a resounding yes. Um, we try very hard and that's one of the things that, that you know, Paul can attest that we do in our um, editorial board meetings is when we review the submissions, we really do try to uh, make sure that we're representing stories that are, that are um, geographically covering you know, a lot of the state. And one of the, the, the things, that little map that we have on the contents page, that was Judy's idea. Um, <laughs> so each little uh, square has the page number for where that story is, is primarily based. So when you look at that, Judy always said, we wanna make sure that map spreads across the state. And that was a challenge. Yep. It still is sometimes. We get a lot of submissions that, you know, from New York metro area um, or covering history in that, in those parts of this, in that part of the state. So um, we also have a question about, so one person has say, saying that she's just learning about the magazine from this presentation, which is fantastic. Um, and wondering if the past issues are indexed and browsable um, so you, they're not indexed in the way that, that you're thinking as far as like searching a keyword index, but we do have highlights from all of our, um, past and current issues available on our website. And that's nysarchivestrust.org. And then you can just click on magazine and you'll see we, get, we there's a featured article from every issue. The covers are all up. So, and if you, if there's a, copy of a back issue that you really want to have in your possession, um, you can just reach out and we can send you um, the, the back issue. But the instructions are all on our, on our website. Somebody is asking, what can, uh, can they as subscribers and fans do to support our efforts? 
Um, you can tell your family and friends about this magazine and encourage them to subscribe. Like I said, we are donor supported and, you know, it's, we, we make this print and digital version and it's, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing to have. And if you, you know, if you have family and friends who haven't subscribed yet, just encourage them. You can give them a gift subscription. Um, that's all on our website as well. Um, you can actually subscribe right there on the website. You don't even have to call anybody. <laughs> So that's one thing you can do. Also, if you have teacher, you know, friends who are educators, let them know. Every issue of New York Archives has a, an educator guide that's developed by a New York State certified teacher. And it's, it's, it's good stuff and it's usable in the classroom right up through college. We've also heard from parents who were using it during the pandemic for, you know, homeschool enrichment. Um, so there's a lot of great ways to use this magazine. So if you want to help, that's that's what I would suggest. Um, just talk about the magazine far and wide. So that covers- and, the, and find us on social media and share it. Yes, please do that also. We're on yeah. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So like us and follow us and share, share us. <laughs> So I want to say thank you so much to Judy, B, Chris, Larry, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us today and for being a part of this magazine and a supporter of the trust for over 20 years. That's amazing. Um, and hopefully you will be for the next 20 years as well. Um, and I also um, would like to make sure everybody knows about our next online speaker series event. Um, which is at 12.30 on Tuesday, April 20th, where we will be joined by former New York Attorney General Robert Abrams to discuss his new book, The Luckiest Guy in the World, My Journey in Politics. You can register for that on our website, which again is nysarchivestrust.org. And that's again, also where you can subscribe to New York Archives. So pass it on. Thank you again to our guests today. And thank you to all of you who joined us. Thank you, Josie. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Thanks, Josie. Good to see everyone. Good to Another see 20 you. years for the magazine. Yeah. Great magazine. <laughs> it's so good to see you all of you. Take care.